Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here and you begin to love what you are hearing, please consider hitting that subscribe button and then make sure you set your notification bell to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video, which tends to be daily or every other day. If you are interested in becoming a member of Back to Ashes, that information can be found down below. Please remember to always check the community tab as that is where I put all announcements for Back to Ashes. Speaking of the community tab, I have now opened September birthdays. Please be respectful of others. If you happen to list a birthday under one of the videos that are narrated, you will not be considered. You must post your September birthday under the post over on the community tab. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Without further ado, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Scary Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Oh, and before I forget, if you hear any jingles in the background, I'm sorry. Stormy is a daddy's girl and she sits right beneath my chair, but I don't think you will mind. Let's get started. So I've told my friends and family this story and they just look at me like I'm crazy. I ended up telling my wife when we were moving out of the house that this happened in. I lived in Nevada with my wife in a newly constructed house that was three floors. The master bedroom was on the third floor and there was no door up to the master floor. It was just open, like a loft, but it was full-sized area, not a converted attic or anything of the sort. This is pretty common in Nevada so that they can squeeze as many thin, taller houses into a lot as possible. Anyway, one night about a month into moving into the house, we're both asleep. I wake up in the middle of the night around 2 to 4 -ish a.m. and see all the way at the other side of the room a little creature, all black. I couldn't make out any features or eyes or, or anything, but it was small maybe two feet tall and had two arms and legs like a person, but was wider and didn't move like a person. It was unnaturally fast. It ran quickly to the edge of the bed, and then I could tell it was looking right at me. I could move, and I very consciously remember thinking, Ugh, I do not have time for this. I remember it peered over the mattress and had a longer nose but for some reason it was not able or allowed to get on the bed. I watched it for about 10 seconds, then was like, okay, if it can't get up, I'm just going to roll over. So I rolled over, and nothing else happened that night. Pretty anticlimactic story, yes I know, but that's what happened to me that night. I was definitely awake, and I could move though, so it was not sleep paralysis. I've had that once, and that is much worse and terrifying. Just wondering if there's a name for what I saw, or if anyone else has had a similar experience happen to them. I've spent my life in Georgia and love hiking all over, but I must admit, North Carolina has the best mountains. For this reason, I frequently drive up there and hike and camp. This time, I went up with my family in an RV, stayed with them in Maggie Valley. The next day, however, I had them drop me off about 10 miles away at the Cold Mountain Trailhead, and I planned to hike up, spend the night, and be back down in the morning. I was by no means inexperienced at hiking or camping, but I had never camped alone. On top of that, I didn't bring a pistol, something I won't go without now. On the way up, the trail was surprisingly strenuous, not necessarily steep, 
I've hiked some steep stuff out west, but more like a ton of ups and downs and feeling like it just wouldn't end. Eventually, it began to get darker, and I realized I need to stop and set up while I still had light. So, I stopped about half a mile short of the summit and figured I would continue in the morning. Nothing eventful happened. I set up camp in a really good spot, ate my food, and went into the tent. At this point, I realized I hadn't run into a single other person my entire way up. This wasn't eerie at the time, but soon would be. I had trouble sleeping and usually lay awake for up to an hour trying to sleep. During this, I thought I heard someone lightly walking around the general area because of the rhythm of the steps. I brushed it off as my mind running wild. But I did pull my big old knife out of my bag and put it next to me in the sleeping bag. That morning, I woke up and ate oatmeal. As I ate, I looked over at my tent and noticed a strange bundle of dried twigs and berries tied with green cord propped up against my tent. I'll see if I can find a picture and put it up later. Internally, I was pissing myself but I packed my crap up and took off within five minutes. And no way I bothered go to the summit. I headed straight down. On the way down, I realized there was a pretty heavy fog, and I ended up on a side trail that eventually ended, and I was just lost. I used a compass to eventually reorient it myself and found the trail again. One of the biggest reliefs. I made it out with no other incident. However, come to find out, the same morning, a 27-year-old died at the same section of trail as me. And it's possible I would have run into them had I not gotten lost and rejoined the trail later. His family seems to have scrubbed the internet of several of the articles on him, but I'll see if I can find something. The scariest part was knowing that someone knew where I was and watched me, and I had no clue about them. It was sometime in the late 90s of the last century. I was a young man, and the internet was still new territory. In search of the great love, or perhaps only in search of sexual gratification, turned out that the AOL chat rooms were a true treasure trove. Here, you could talk to women without first having to visually convince them, and what was even better? Here, you could impress them with polished sentences, clever or witty statements, and if I found one thing easy, then the written word. So many things happened, and I was visiting a complete stranger almost every weekend in another city. Unfortunately, these meetings meant that I spent several hundred kilometers and many hours every weekend on the highway, because only in the rarest of cases the date was in the immediate vicinity. The internet knows neither borders or distances. It happened that on this special weekend, I once again covered endless kilometers on a German motorway, only to meet a very likable chat acquaintance in real life. You all know that for sure. After some time in the car, you think about nothing special. You sing along to the radio and you beat up the poor steering wheel with bumbling drums. You are in the long distance flow. The kilometers pull past. One exit is like the other. The rest stops are indistinguishable and you overtake hundreds of trucks and you witness the tank needle as it moves to the E, to the fuel gauge, like an unstoppable snail. Then, the unlikely happened. I was driving through a construction site. The lanes were severely narrowed. 60 kilometers high top speed was suggested. I drove maybe 5 kilometers faster than the big 18-tonner next to me which I comfortably passed. One of his tires, almost as tall as my complete Volkswagen Beetle, was just at the height of the cab, as with an incredibly loud bang. 
a vertible explosion. The front tire next to me shattered off the lorry. Rubber parts flew on my front and side windows, and a kind of foggy smoke enveloped my car as almost 100 PSI made their way out of their couch of prison. That's it, I thought, and in a few moments the realization of my imminent death manifested in my head. My co-driver put his hand on my shoulder and said in a sonorous and gentle voice, stay calm. I felt a warm, comforting feeling settle over my chest from my shoulder, and I concentrated on keeping the car straight and on the narrow lane near the sight boundary nor the truck to touch. And indeed, the fog went away. The last little black rubber parts were blown off of the bonnet, and I could see the road again. In the rearview mirror, I saw the trucker bring his car to a halt, and I too ran to the right and set my engine down with trembling hands. With a thick lump in my throat and suffocating voice, I stuttered a, thank you, to my passenger as the realization ran down my back in an icy chill. I was alone in the car. A glance at the passenger seat confirmed that, and the empty cold leatherette of the passenger seat suddenly made everything seem totally surreal around me. There was a knock on my disc, and the question, are you okay, brought me back to reality. To this day, I have not told this story to anyone, as it really happened every time I skipped the part with a passenger. I can't describe how big of a relief it is to share this with you. During my freshman and sophomore years of college, I was extremely awkward. I had just come out as gay, and I didn't have any friends, and I was just generally kind of a big wad of social anxiety. Given that I didn't even have the social skills to make new friends, it's not surprising that I also had literally no dating experience. Miraculously, over the course of the summer after sophomore year, I just sort of grew out of the worst of my awkwardness. I lost some weight, had a lot more confidence in myself, and my self-esteem was a lot higher. I came back to school in August, and by October, I had a decent number of genuine friends and had gotten a lot more involved on campus. With my newfound confidence, I decided I'd finally download Grindr and see what it was like. For everyone who doesn't know, Grindr is a gay dating app that is primarily used for finding sex and hookups. Despite my recent involvement in the social arena, I was still extremely naive and inexperienced when it came to dating and sex. I set up my Grindr profile with a nice picture of myself and a very brief bio, and I get a lot of messages very quickly after my picture got approved. One guy who messaged me had a display name of dad for young which should have been my first red flag, but I was oblivious. I should note that I look really young for my age. At the time, I was 21, but I was regularly asked by campus staff which middle or high school I was visiting from. I'm 23 now, and I still get asked if I want a kid's menu if I go to a restaurant with my parents. Yeah, it's pretty bad. So, dad for young sends me a message that just says, what's up? And I reply without looking at his profile first. I then look at his profile and notice he's 54. His only profile text says, the younger the better. And his only picture was a zoomed in blurry picture of a hairy chest. So I was very much not interested. But given my inexperience, I thought ignoring him would be horribly rude. So I kept responding. I don't totally remember what we talked about in the maybe 10 or so messages we exchanged at first, but I do remember him telling me, saying I was very cute. 
I know I told him I was a student, but I never mentioned which college I went to. It's important to note that I went to a college in a major city, and there's a bunch of different colleges all within like 5 miles of each other, and a few more within 10 miles of those. Sort of like Tinder, Grinder works based off of your location, but much more precisely. If you're less than a mile or two away from someone who is online, it will display the distance in feet. I noticed that dad for youngs profile said he was 25 miles away, which I thought was kind of far. dad for young started getting more sexual in his chats and asked if I wanted to meet up. I felt bad flat out denying him since he had been polite, so I told him I didn't want to meet up with him that day, but that we could keep chatting if he wanted. I figured that was that, and when I checked 20 minutes later, it said he was offline. Nope. About 30 minutes later after that, I get another message from him. Hey, my name. I got a wild hair and thought I'd take a nice drive out to my college. Smiley face. I had not told him the name of my college, nor had I told him which part of town I was in. I looked at his profile, and it now said he was three miles away. I started freaking out a little bit and didn't reply to his messages in hopes that he'd just leave me alone. And it's important to note that my college had a couple of different campus chunks separated by a few miles. I lived on the upperclassmen residential campus, which was about two miles from the main campus where all of the other student dorms and main buildings are. I feel like if he was going to try to find me, he'd go to the main campus first, then maybe give up since not many outside people know about the separate residential campus. Five or six minutes later, I get another message that says something like, no fun if you don't play along. What building, residential campus name, are you in? His profile now says he's over 2,500 feet away, and every time I reopened his profile, the distance would decrease. I was fully losing my shit at this point, since this guy had the ability to pinpoint my location. So I shut my blinds, turned off my lights, and locked my window the door to the apartment, and my bedroom door. My roommate was also out of town on some kind of retreat, so it was just me. He kept sending me messages every minute or so, saying things like, I'm gonna find you, here I come, and other supremely creepy shit like that. The distance was down to 310 feet and I was completely losing my mind and didn't know what to do. So I just deleted my entire profile. Nothing else happened that night, though I was absolutely terrified he was going to come knocking on my door. Fast forward to three days, I decided to re-download Grindr after doing more research and seeing that I can adjust the settings so that my exact location is not visible. When I logged on the first time with my pre-made profile, I adjusted some of the search filters until the results were specific enough to display Dad for Young's profile, which I promptly blocked. Later that evening, I got a message from someone with the display name, Will Find You, with the same gross profile picture as Dad for Young, and my stomach sinks. He sent a flurry of messages. You fucked up. Almost got police called on me because of you. Couldn't find you, so I had to go to other dorms and find someone else. Said I was outside his dorm and told me to leave and he'd call the cops. I'm coming for that sweet virgin asshole. It freaked me out. Blocked him again, deleted my profile again, then deleted Grinder. I refused to re-download it or any dating apps for about a year after that. At which point, I worked up the courage to try again, and have not heard from this nut job since. Thank you, God. So, terrifying old man with a fetish for young, inexperienced guys, please, let's not ever meet again.
So I was doing what I do best the other day. By that I mean sitting through the depraved cesspool of the internet known as the deep web and just generally being a lazy sack of shit. I spend a lot of time doing that, just randomly clicking links to things I probably shouldn't and then being horrified by what lies on the other side. I've seen a lot of shit on there. Gore boards, docked bins, torture sites, Andro life rape, animal cruelty. You get the picture. You've all heard the stories. Everything wrong with the human species can be found somewhere on the deep web, or so they say. I find it all fascinating to glimpse people when anonymity takes hold and see what monstrous things people are capable of behind closed doors. It's like peeling back the curtain on a Sesame Street play and finding the showrunners having a satanic orgy backstage. You see people for what they really are. Monsters. So, I began my voyage, monster in hand and freshly stoned mind, ready to be mortified. From my closet, the inflatable erotic doll I had been giving as a gag Christmas present looked on in a disapproving manner with a lifeless, open-mouthed stare. Don't judge me, Miley. I performed the usual diagnostics and booted up tour. I found myself on the hidden wiki soon after, staring at the dozens of links available for the taking. I saw little of interest there, so quickly I switched over to DuckDuckGo. I pondered upon what to type in the search for a bit. You have to be careful how you go about browsing Tor and randomly entering murder or torture into a search bar, which could leave you into a world of trouble. You never know who's lurking. I finally ended up typing in one word. Sick. That ought to get some interesting results. The results were initially less than stellar, but soon I did find myself on an apparent blog of some sort. Darkness of the soul. Edginess level maximum. I glanced through the blog and found dozens of entries, ranging from paranormal, conspiracy theories, short stories, and real-life crime essays. It was actually pretty interesting, and the guy who wrote it was indeed pretty gifted in the vernacular department. I spent some time glancing through them until one entry caught my eye. It was titled, Dark Sights on the Dark Web. Are they real? I found my interest piqued, and so I clicked it. The article listed several relatively prominent and notoriously vile sites like Cannibal Cafe, Cruel Onion Wiki, Violent Fantasies, and Playpen, none of which were what I was really looking for, but then one caught my eye that I did not recognize. It was listed only as the site with no name. The author was even kind enough to provide a link, to which I clicked without a moment's hesitation. This hidden site has been seized as part of a joint law enforcement operation by blah 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 blah. I groaned while reclining in my swivel chair and downing the remainder of my monster. They always have to take away the fun. Just as I was about to click back through, though, I noticed a small detail which drew my attention back. In the lower left-hand quadrant of the page, there was a slight discoloration that caught my eye. I've seen the same message hundreds of times, but this one looked different. On a whim, I highlighted the section with my mouse. Just as I had suspected, a series of text lit up with strands of numbers. The numbers just looked like gibberish at first. But on closer inspection, I noticed a single Russian word, Voiti. Translation, enter. Luckily for me, I speak a bit of Russian, so I recognized the phrase right away. I hovered the cursor over the word and watched as the pointer, too, shifted to indicate a hidden link. Clever, hiding behind a smoke screen like that. That's a first for me. I clicked it. 
The page loaded for a while before finally opening to a new page. It was black with red font and, much as the article suggested, had no title on top of the page. It appeared to be just another catalog site. There was actually very little of substance anywhere on the page, just random links with no indication as to where they may lead. I clicked several of the links, but all of them turned out to be dead. Well, except for one, that is, which happened to be a disgusting image of a woman shitting on a guy's face. I nearly vomited at the sight of it. I have a pretty strong stomach when it comes to gore and violence, but who is my kryptonite? Why someone would allow someone else to defecate on them? I just will never understand it. But then again, there's a lot of things I'll never understand, especially regarding the dark web. I knew it was a troll on their end, and I'll admit, they got me pretty good. I knew they were hiding something, though. I mean, why go to the trouble of constructing an elaborate decoy if there wasn't anything illegal going on? Sure, creating the backdrop of the infamous government agency message wouldn't be too difficult, but if nothing illegal was going on, then why bother doing it at all? Mimicking my efforts from earlier, I highlighted the page once again. Sure enough, there was something at the bottom of the page which had been all but invisible beforehand. It was a series of numbers spaced out horizontally. I thought at first it was another address, but there was no dot onion at the end. The numbers were organized as follows. 4, 9, 11, 6, 2, 7, 12, 1, 3, 8, 10. Five. I thought maybe it was some sort of password of first glance, but to what? All the links were dead except for the one with that nasty image, and I was not about to click on that again. I pondered over the image for a moment before noticing another detail. I counted the links and noticed that there were 12 in total. That had to be related to the numbers. I thought maybe clicking each link in the order correlating to the strand of numbers would unlock something, so I tried that. After clicking the last one, though, nothing had changed. I sat back and again studied the chain of numbers. There had to be a pattern or method to know they were organized. I pulled my phone out and punched the numbers into Google, but found nothing but tips for calculating fractions. In no mood for math, I put my phone away and again stared at the screen. What if the numbers were related to the links? What if this was simply a clue to another site of some kind? I scoured all over the page, clicking every square inch to try and find something. I don't know why I had become so infatuated with discovering this answer, but boredom can be a deadly motivator. Suddenly, I was struck with an epiphany while staring at the top of the page. It had 12 digits in it. In fact, most, if not all, dot onion addresses had 12 digits in them. What if the numbers were clues to an entirely new address? I counted the links, and lo and behold, there was a grand total of 12, each with 12 digits. Maybe each number was in relation to the link in the sequence. Maybe they were dead links because they were never designed to lead anywhere. They were only designed to be clues. On a new hunch, I wrote down the fourth digit at the top link, the ninth on the second, the eleventh on the third, so on and so forth until I had an entirely new web address. I typed what I had written into the search bar and hit enter. My eyes widened as another web page began to load. I gave myself a metaphoric pat on the back for unraveling the mystery, but had no idea what I was about to stumble into. The page finally loaded, and I was given a new name at the top of the page. Happy Fun Time. There were dozens of pictures and videos organized all over the page, none of which I would ever describe with the words happy or fun. 
It was a gore forum. My heart pulsated in my chest as I looked upon the first image. It was a picture of a guy who had his skull crushed beneath the tire of a truck. Blood and gray matter had been scattered everywhere as several onlookers stood about gawking at the scene. The second was an image of another guy who had been decapitated and had his genitals placed in his mouth. Probably a victim of the cartels, if I had to guess. The third was a video, a very depraved video. It was grainy quality and terribly shaky, but after a few seconds, it showed what appeared to be a lone woman walking down the street at night. The person filming was obscured by a couple dozen yards away in some alley. Suddenly, two men and another man emerged further down the street and bum-rushed the woman. They were on her in an instant before she even had time to scream. They grabbed her and the cameraman sprang up to join the action. All the while, he chuckled quietly in the most unsettling tone I had ever heard anyone utter. It was a giddy and juvenile giggle, the likes of which could only be produced by a severely deranged individual. The woman attempted to scream, but the two men held her mouth firmly, preventing her from doing so. They dragged her back into an alley, as the giggling cameraman followed. I turned it off then, knowing exactly where it was headed. A reasonable person would have just exited the site by that point, but morbid curiosity is a powerful narcotic. The next entry on the list, though, ensured that any doubts I had the authenticity of the site would no longer stand. It was a series of pictures, this time involving a little girl who couldn't have been more than five years old. She had sandy blonde hair and royal blue eyes. The picture was innocuous at first, or at least they would have been if not for the site, which they had posted on. It started as just pictures that looked to be taken straight from someone's Facebook profile. A deep pit formed in my stomach as I sifted through them. The pictures began to grow ever more disturbing as they went. At first, it was the little girl with her family and dog. But soon the pictures began to look as though someone was taking them without her knowledge. There was one where she was swinging at the park with several other children. Another where she was playing with toys in the backyard with the picture looking like it was taken from over the fence. I felt a cold chill creep down my spine as I anticipated where the pictures were headed. One picture stood out immediately. It was of a house at night illuminated only by the flash of the camera. The next picture showed two people, a man and woman lying in bed. Their throats had both been slit and their bed was soiled with a dark crimson. The next picture showed the little girl clearly distressed with a black swollen eye. The remainder of the pictures went on to show the unknown cameraman take her and do terrible things to her. I won't even dignify his actions by putting them to paper. Some things are just better off forgotten entirely. Needless to say, it was the most goddamn disgusting thing I have ever seen. As horrible as the images were, the comments may have been almost on par. They were a mix of English and Russian. There were dozens of them, with almost all lobbing heaps of praise onto the cameraman and expressing their own sexual gratification with his actions. God is dead, and the dark web is proof of that. How in the world did we get to the point in which human beings can act like this and exist? I felt sorrow rise from within me for the innocent young girl who had been so violently violated and torn from the world. Normally, I feel nothing for random people on the internet, but the tragedy that befell her reminded me of things done to me in my own past. Maybe that's why I'm so fucked up. More than sorrow, though, I felt anger. That was when I made my first mistake. 
Congratulations, fellas. You are without a doubt the most disgusting sacks of shit in the entire world. Cops have been notified, so have fun jerking each other off in the time you have left. Might as well do the world a favor, though, and just kill yourselves. I couldn't stop my hands from typing out the message, and before I knew it, my comment was inscribed just below all the others. It sat upon the screen for a moment before others began to appear, all of them insulting me and making fun of my empathy for the girl. Myself and the other users fired back and forth for a while before a familiar user posted. It was the same profile in which had first posted the images to begin with. His first post confused me, as it was only a set of numbers with intermediate periods. I glanced at the comment before a horrible realization took hold. It was an IP address. My IP address. Before I could react, he followed up with my full name, address, and social security number. I froze, unable to figure out how in the hell he had tracked me. It was then that I discovered my second mistake. Like an idiot, I had neglected to activate tails. They had traced me. Son of a bitch. Thanks for stopping by, my friend. I'll see you soon. Then you will get a whole episode on this site, staring at you. His words sent chills right down my spine. I stared at the screen, dumbfounded and without a clue how to proceed. Not content with two mistakes and apparently with a secret lust for self-endangerment and masochism. I made a third one. Fuck off. I posted the comment and quickly shut down the Tor browser and closed my laptop. I thought about the events that had just transpired and somehow just ended up laughing them off. After a while, there was no way that bastard is going to go through the trouble of tracking me down. People say shit online all the time, but they never act upon it. It's all just empty threats. Either way, though, I had some preparation to take care of. I called the police on the non-emergency hotline and informed them of the events. I gave them the web address I had gotten, and they told me they would investigate it. After that, I called my insurance company to alert them about someone finding my social and proceeded to drink myself stupid hoping liquor would drown out the memories. Days went by and nothing had changed. That is, until the end of the week. I had just returned from work when I saw an unfamiliar black Astro van sitting down the block from my house. I paid it little mind at the time, and to be honest, only realized the implications after the event. I had since forgotten my careless spree into the deep net from days earlier, and thought nothing of the van. I got inside and again booted up my computer for some mindless browsing. As I did, I heard a noise outside. It sounded like someone climbing the fence outside. I live alone and have two pets, so I knew whatever it was wasn't for my house. I thought about investigating it, but quickly the shattering of glass made it clear that it was not a good idea. I heard footsteps emanate from down below, giving the distinct sound of boots on hardwood floor. They grew nearer and nearer, and I found myself frozen with terror. It was like my body just refused to accept the situation and would not respond no matter what I did. That would have been a most astute time for me to have gotten my gun. Problem was, I didn't have one. The footsteps got louder and louder all the way up the stairs with booming stomps of feet. I heard them trudge towards my bedroom door and linger just outside. My heart jumped into my throat and sweat had begun to drip from every square inch of my body. The door slowly creeped open and in stepped a man with dark clothing and a simplistic porcelain mask. He walked inside, brandishing a suppressed pistol in his right hand. He grew closer and closer 
and then he walked right past me. I don't know why they never bother to check the closet. It's always the first place I would look. I guess maybe he was too distracted by the doll which sat at the desk, hood up and headphones on to complete the decoy, and lull in the approaching predator. I guess the inflatable sex doll came in handy after all. He stepped towards the dummy, and I emerged from behind like a tiger from the jungle, silent and with ravenous hunger. I could feel the saliva beginning to pool in my mouth as he reached the prop. He put a hand on the dummy, and I put my hand on his throat. He struggled, like they all do, and I quickly had stripped the firearm from his grip. A simple incision under the arm with a blade does wonders in demanding obedience. All it takes is a slit to the ulnar nerve, and the arm becomes essentially useless. The unbearable pain it causes is also a bonus. He dropped the gun, and I slammed him to the ground face first. With one motion, I put my foot on his left elbow and grabbed his wrist with my hand, while the other held the blade to his throat. I then leered close behind him and whispered to him, What time does my episode air? I don't want to miss it. Before he could respond, I yanked his arm backwards while pushing my boot firmly onto his elbow. His bone cracked and then popped from its hinge as his arm bent backwards in the opposite direction it was meant to. The man cried out an agonizing scream, but I quickly silenced him. He writhed upon the ground and moaned pitifully as the blood began to drip from his mangled arm. His eyes looked back at me, and I could see that oh-so-sweet luster of panic-stricken prey glisten in his dark, bloodying eyes. The hunter has now become the hunted, and I could not stop the diabolic grin from slithering its way onto my face. It's time to feed. It's a weird feeling when you first kill someone. Most start as a crime of passion anger, which boils over and leads to an act of violence. You learn a lot about people in their last seconds of life, their secrets, their faith, their fear. You learn a lot about yourself, too, like how you, a normal dude, could so easily swipe the life from another. There is a raw, primal satisfaction in that feeling, knowing that you, yourself, had dominion over death. The feeling is addictive. Once is never enough, though, and soon you will feel the urge to repeat your actions. The dopamine rush, the burst of euphoria, it's as sweet as honey to the mind. I was more careful from then on, picking targets with no relation to me, and no reason to suspect my intent. After a time, though, I grew tired of targeting the unsuspected populace. It just didn't throw me in the way it used to. You can only shoot fish in a barrel so many times before you want to dive into the ocean. What I needed was a new challenge, a new prey to rekindle the flame beneath me. I didn't want the sheep anymore. What I need now is the wolf. Do you have any idea how satisfying it is to see the eyes of a predator turn into a helpless little lamb? To know that the terror they once instilled in each other is now force-fed down their own throat. They never expect it, and there is no feeling so delicious. It is the ultimate poetic justice, monstrous action done to monstrous people. The flood of adrenaline through their system also gives the meat a wonderful flavor. The real name is irrelevant, for the animals of history will forget. But I have become known in certain circles by my adopted moniker. Sig Sepsis. You can find my advertisements all over the web, in one form or another. My skills are taboo, but refined. My clientele willing, and their tastes insatiable. To hunt a monster, you must know how to find a monster. You must become a monster. 
So, to all the friends upon the forum known as Happy Fun Time and the rest of the world at large, I see you. If any of you gentlemen would like to retrieve the remains of your fallen comrade, then you know where to find me. And if you, dear listener, happen to partake in the odious fantasies of the repugnant underworld as well, then perhaps I will see you one day as well. So the story started when I was 14. I'm 17 now, by the way. So I used to play in a park with my friends. I had a crush on a boy who was 14 as well, who used to play with us, and he too had a crush on me. And he had a friend who was older than him, 16 or 17 maybe, I think. So we all used to play together. I always saw my crush's friend as a brother but his feelings for me were not appropriate. He liked me. So, one day, on my birthday, he randomly approached me and told me that he loved me. I replied that I did not have the same feelings for him and liked someone else. He did not take the no as an answer. Now, that's when the creepy part started. I recently joined Instagram, and somehow he found my Insta ID and began messaging me about how much he loved me. I rejected him multiple times, but he just won't stop. So I blocked him. Now, he started making multiple Insta accounts to stalk me and message me from every single one of them, but I just kept blocking him. I was annoyed and enraged at this point and threatened him that I would report him to the cyber police. So... He took it upon his own ego and kind of started following me at places. He would take the same route as mine, knew the timings about when I was going to the park, when I was going to buy groceries. So, whenever I went out of the house, he would creepily stare and continue ogling until I was out of sight. He won't even budge his eyes for a second. When I used to play, I stopped playing with him, by the way, but he continuously roamed around me and stared. Now, I was scared to a point where I started hesitating to go out of the house. Whenever I saw him, my heart would drop. I started hyperventilating. I thought this was only me who found him creepy. But when my mom was like, who is that guy who always roams around you? He doesn't give me good vibes to stay away from him. I was like, yep, he is bad, and you know that. That person is not very good if your mother's instincts sense something fishy. This went on for a whole two years, and his staring or messaging and stalking from fake accounts didn't stop. He even went to the extent to manipulate a friend of mine and my crush, whom I started dating, that I was a slut. We didn't break up, though. That's when I had had enough and decided to take action. I went straight to that bastard and slapped him right in the face. To this day, whenever I hear his name or see his picture, I get a panic attack and my hands and legs start shaking in fear. In fact, he was sexually attracted to one of my friends and asked her if he could see her breasts. She was too scared to do anything to him or tell an adult. That's when I had to lay one more slap across his face. And that, dear listeners, brings it close to these true scary stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of the channel and also the gifted membership. Luz Crispin, Patty's Needs, Samantha Blaze, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Christy Elias, Denise S., Tina Me, Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, Sugared Spike, and Anita B. Thank you all for remaining the peers for which Back to Ashes stands upon. 
I cannot express my love and thank you enough. <laughs> All right, and then we have our gifted memberships. The Conspiracy Archives, Grimm's Library, Adam Grigg, Nat Davies, and The Cryptid Sleeps. Thank you all so much for your support. I truly appreciate you. And to the other subscribers and listeners, thank you so much for supporting Back to Ashes. Not only does it help it grow, but without you, I would not have a voice. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.